Good evening, everybody. We'll call tonight's meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will begin tonight, as we always do, with public audience. Is there anyone who would like to speak tonight? Uh, Joan. Joan Cole, 26 Whitcomb Drive. On se over several years, the Board of Ethics under the Chairman, Dave Moore, has continued to review the conflicts that may arise when Mike Payne, the President of Payne's Rubbish Removal, during his tenure on the Board of Selectmen. David Moore is Vice President of the Democratic Party, and Mike Payne is on the Town Committee of the Republican Party. Mike Payne has always inserted on his conflicts of interest form that he is President of Payne's Rubbish and has a contract with the Town for rubbish removal and has a contract for collection of waste at the Town Dump. However, David Moore has asked for information that no other person is required to provide. The advisory opinion of the Board of Ethics, April 30th, 2018, pertaining to Mike Payne, quote, regarding conflict of interest disclosures going forward, Mr. Payne, like other members of town government, must continue to file the required form with the town clerk, end quote. Mike Payne has always filed his conflict of interest form with the disclosures quote on the advisory opinion to the extent that he continues to have contracts with the town or other sources of conflicting interest he should note on the disclosure form in addition to the nature of the contracts an approximate amount of each contract with the understanding that the town manager will make that document available to the board of selectmen end quote it appears to me that Dave Moore, Vice President of the Democratic Party, has a vendetta against Mike Payne as a Republican, asking him to supply information above and, be, above and beyond required by anyone else. The advisory opinion suggests that David Moore was concerned about Mr. Payne's candidate for first selectman and the additional conflicts that would arise, making it almost impossible for him to assume the first selectman position if he were elected. David Moore should be asked to resign from the Board of Ethics. David Moore does not have any concerns about that Dave Ryan, president of Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts, SMA SIMPAC, does not have any conflict under the areas of exception with the town clerk, although the Meadows Performing Arts Sims, uh, Center has become bef uh, before the zoning board where Dave Ryan is chairman. Dave Ryan is on the Democratic Town Committee. It appears that being on the Democratic Town Committee gives you a special status in Simsbury. On December 5th, 2017, the Conservation Commission sent a letter to Dave Ryan in his capacity as president of the uh, PAC to alert him about spraying for mosquitoes on Simsbury Meadows prior to the concert that is no longer permitted. The letter states, and I quote, recently published authoritative scholarship has made clear that we were misinformed in regard to pesticide application. Pesticides are not different from other materials under state wetlands law and our town regulations. Any application of pesticides in a wetland area within 100 feet of wetland area or indeed any other place where the application will affect wetlands is a required activity that requires a permit from this body, which is the Conservation Commission. Dave Ryan has ignored the requirements to submit an application for a permit through the Conservation Commission and will continue to spray for mosquitoes prior to events. This is a violation of the law and Dave Ryan will be fined for ignoring the application process if he continues to spray prior to the concert. The application for mosquito spraying at the Simsbury High School graduation at the Simsbury Meadows was denied and there will be no mosquito spraying prior to the graduation. The PAC will be starting events in Simsbury Meadows, as noted, in the agenda item. They will be required to adhere to their contract with the town and pay fair market value for all services. Since the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center is a private organization with a contract that requires them to submit an audit report to the town with many other contractual requirements, the PAC should be required to pay fair market value for the use of the town land. The PAC should also be, not be allowed to use town parking areas for tailgating prior to concerts. Marijuana use should not be condoned. The Terrapin Band playing music from Grateful Dead 
on a day-long concert should have police presence for the entire event. There will be beer, wine, and food supplied on the property throughout the concert. The pack in the town will be mind should be mindful of the impact of noise, excessive alcohol consumption, and use of illegal drugs at concerts, placing the town at risk for irresponsible behavior. Cura Leaf, the pot factory, will be coming before the Zoning Commission on June 18, 2018 at 7 p.m. for a public hearing on application to move from 100 Miller's Way to 34 Hop Meadow Street, the CLMP site. According to the DEP, this site is listed as one of the contaminated sites in Simsbury. Does the town have any requirements for remediation on the site before the transfer of property? And all of my comments will be posted on Simsbury Patch, Twitter at Joan Co., Newsfeed on Facebook, and Simsbury Forum Topics. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Joan. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Mr. Kalishman? Thank you. Robert Kalishman, Simsbury. Uh, to quote a seer and one of our sages, Maimonides, if, not, if I'm not for myself, then who will be for me? And if I am for myself, what will they say, if not now, when? And I just thought I'd bring that up because... Uh, these conflicts of interest, they have to stop. And these shots that are being made, one party making at another party, that should stop too. And it should be done from within, not from without. There should be enough dignity in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party to tell people, hey, enough's enough. But things go on. I noticed in tonight's discussion, Mr. Ryan's name has been brought up. Through my participating in attending the meetings and see what has transpired in this board, I've seen where it started, where we had Tom Vincent running the show, Republican. Mr. Ryan was very, very critical of Mr. Vincent in running the show. Finally, Ms. Glassman, Democrat, came up. She appointed Dave Ryan, who just stepped off of the Board of Selectmen and needed some place to go. So what happened? He became the Board for the Performing Arts. He selected each and every member and presented them to each party. And now I notice he's back tonight and what gets me is proposed Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center board appointments, blank. Any other agency that reports people to be replaced or resignations has it on the thing, the person's name, and the appointee. For some reason, performing arts, they don't have to abide by the rules. Now, whether it's a rule or it's not rule, it should be a matter of ethics, self-ethics, that you don't do these things behind closed doors. And I don't have an ax to grind, but I'll say in front of them, Enough's enough, Dave. You want the board of the zoning? Fine. You want the performing arts? Fine. But you can't have everything. And a lot of people come to me and they, they want to know what's going on there. And for a year, nobody knew what was going on there. And you people, every time he comes looking for money, it was given to him. Whether it was 50000 and, and one time he's not here this evening, but the Mr. Askham said, that's the end of it. You don't get any more. And then this evening I come in, Jerry Toner's gone, and the first thing I see is Mr. Ryan lobbying our new 
Parks and Rec director. I didn't participate in the conversation. I could care less. But the perception is there. And it's wrong. And this, pardon the vernacular, this I don't give a hell attitude has to stop. It's wrong. And it's just getting to Mr. Moore. I've gone in front of the Ethics Commission and I've been told, well, you can't go in front. If you mention anybody's name, we throw it out. And I've talked to people in the state and they say it's, a, it's, it's useless, even these ethics boards, they're so politically tainted, tainted that it's wrong. And I've gone before the, the board and people have made, and they've made decisions on me over the back fence. Two people live butt to butt, and they tell me they didn't discuss the case. And I wrote letters to Mr. Dave Moore, and there's a conflict of him being the chairman of the Ethics Commission, then he's chairman for John Hampton's campaign, and there's been ethics on the campaign. He's been cited, Mr. Payne, that is, and Mr. Moore, who was his campaign manager, they've been cited for unethical practices with the board of the uh, with the uh, Connecticut State uh, Board. In fact, the Chamber that's, of Commerce. That's five they, minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah how close. John Hampton, and, and we had all those robot calls. Nobody said anything, and we sit here, and nobody's going to say anything tonight because Mr. Chairman, Mr. First Selectman. They're going to tell you what to do from the board of, from the Democratic Party. You're just here. You're just a, you're just a, uh, a figurehead. Thank you. Anybody Thank else you. want to talk tonight? Yes, sir. I'm uh, Dwayne Rillies. <clears throat> I live at 26 Haversteel Road. And uh, I've been a senior for quite a while, recently retired. And when I retired, I, <clears throat> I was able to pick up uh, pickleball. That's what I wanted to talk about. Just mention this, <clears throat> that uh, pickleball needs to be uh, line, needs to be added to town uh, tennis courts and the school tennis courts. <clears throat> just run down where, where we do have tennis courts. The Henry James Middle School has four tennis courts. <clears throat> Happens that the parking lot's never full there. <clears throat> you could, the uh, seniors could play if we had uh, pickleball lines there. There's uh, plenty of parking at the uh, Henry James Middle School. Simsbury High has uh, eight tennis courts, which are being rebuilt, brand new tennis courts. <clears throat> they haven't got the nets up, and they don't have the li the, any lines on. They, they, they uh, can't be used yet. <clears throat> we could have, uh, I, I suggest that we, we uh, add pickleball lines to, the, to maybe two tennis courts at the high school out of eight. <clears throat> I mention that because there's, we've got at least uh, 24 seniors that are playing quite regularly, pickleball. But at the high school, the... Uh, which, Tennis is a uh, spring sport, and there was 13 girls and not nine boys playing uh, on the tennis team. But we got uh, eight tennis courts that need to be uh, lined and nets put up. Simsbury Farms has uh, five new tennis courts. The courts do have green lines added for for youngsters' ability because <clears throat> youngsters can't hit the ball as far. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, s uh, see some. Uh, Two courts of the five, two courts that, that have uh, pickleball lines added to them. The uh, Terrafield Park has two two tennis courts. That's where I'm able, I am able to play uh, pickleball and uh, <clears throat> some crack surfaces. But yellow lines were were, were added for pickleball. <clears throat> There's a uh, at least two, two dozen seniors that played uh, two, two days a week there in the morning, Tuesdays and Thursdays. 
and there's a lot of <clears throat> the other courts. Windsor has uh, pickleball. Granby has pickleball. Farmington has pickleball. And uh, we don't have very much pickleball available here in uh, in Simsbury. And we do have a lot of seniors. Yeah, right. And they, uh, uh, we'd like to get some active seniors. <clears throat> Just to finish up here. Say more senior citizens will play for health and socializing if some Simsbury tennis courts were lined for pickleball. Simsbury youth are well served by the town recreation department and schools. Simsbury, Simsbury seniors own homes that pay taxes for the youth. <clears throat> and we should get uh, some more uh, benefit for, from it. As I mentioned, Win uh, Windsor, Granby, Avon, have uh, pickleball lines added to the tennis courts. And I <clears throat> propose and request the town, and I'll, I'll be talking to the school, uh, I think it's later this week. I propose that the uh, school in town add pickleball lines to four tennis courts in Simsbury. And I, I, I believe we, uh, Joan has, has forwarded the, some signatures here, but I, I would leave them. Can I leave them with you? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually had my first opportunity to view pickleball on YouTube about five minutes before this meeting, so it's very good timing. Mm -hmm. I believe it's the fastest growing sport in the United States. <laughs> I'm not surprised. There you go. Really? As for participation, yeah. When you go from zero to... Mm -hmm. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Nope. Well, invite me out. I'll, I'll come out any time you want to play. No. Um, be careful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anybody else want to go see that? <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, Steve. Good evening. I will be quick. Steve Mitchell, 384 Hamendo Street, Simsbury. Um, reason why I'm, I come to talk to you tonight is something exciting. Thank you very much for being part of the art trail and the Selectman bike ride that we had past month. Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, Terraville School, extremely important meeting. As I have served eight years on the board of East Coast Greenway, I did not understand how every six months the trail changed in length. There are two women that are riding their bicycles from Key West to Canada right now. They're in Connecticut. On Wednesday, they'll be riding from New Haven to Hartford. They will be skirting the south part of Simsbury. The East Coast Greenway was designated to go through Simsbury, through Terraville, to Bloomfield. We'd like that to still happen, but that depends on you. As you may or may not know, the Department of Transportation, the state of Connecticut, is looking at ways to get from New Haven to Hartford. It is not the shortest distance from New Haven to Hartford to go through Avon, Simsbury, and Bloomfield. Um, there are some measures that want to bring the trail over the ridge, Plainville, Southington Way. We want, the town of Simsbury wants the East Coast Greenway to go through the town in a big way, economically, and, and for a whole lot of reasons down the road, that you're gonna want the East Coast Greenway to be designated through the town of Simsbury. I worked real hard to keep that through my years of being on the board. Down south, where the, where the trail wasn't so defined as to where they were putting it, we would have people just show up at our board meetings from various towns saying, please bring it to our town, because they know that ecotourism someday 10, 15, 20 years from now is going to be huge. It's going to be a big. When these gals come through Simsbury on Wednesday, they will not be going through the center of Simsbury. I don't know if you noticed this, but because of some, a bad experiment by DOT through 187 and 189, right after the flood of 55, the DO Department of Transportation decided to put some. Uh, limited access highway out of 187 and 189 in Bloomfield and it actually resulted in, t in perhaps you know, a death the other about two years ago to uh, my brother's neighbor uh, Paul Hughes and so 
just pay attention. Um, Commissioner Redeker said to me a couple weeks ago, what's going on in Simsbury? And I said, we're getting there. The town engineers of Bloomfield and Simsbury are working together to create a, a path to go from Bloomfield to Terraville and from Simsbury, which that money is there, it needs to be used. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow night's meeting is all about how do we get from uh, the Cracker Barrel, basically, to the, the soccer fields. So through Terraville Park or however we're going to do it through Governor's Bridge. But that started, that process started, I want to say, four years ago, Tom? Three, Three years ago? So, so the Milona Mil McFroom, I think, was the engineer firm? Yes. So please pick up where that was left off three years ago. That's all. Thank you, Steve. Have a great day. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay. In that case, we'll move into uh, the first selectman's report. So actually staying on, on this topic, uh, the preliminary designs have been completed for a multi-use trail, which is a joint project between Simsbury and Bloomfield. The path would be near St. Andrew's Church in Bloomfield and continue north along 189, ending in Terrafield Village. Simsbury and Bloomfield are conducting an information meeting on June 12th, which is uh, tomorrow, Tuesday at 6 p.m. at Terraville School, 42 Winthrop Street. There'll be a formal presentation made at 6.30 and there will be an opportunity to provide public feedback. For the third year in a row, the town of Simsbury was recognized as one of the 20 safest communities in Connecticut. The town ranks eighth according to the SafeWise report, which was based on FBI crime data, showing property crime and violent crime were well below the national average. In my report that we'll be emailing out, there'll be a link to, to that full report. Starting later this month, renovations will begin at Eno Hall to improve the kitchen, construct additional storage space, and bathroom renovations. During construction, the lower level of Eno will be closed. Parking in the rear of the building will be limited. The elevator and the existing handicapped accessible ramp on the north side of the building will remain open during construction. The first and the second floors of Eno uh, will remain open through the first floor entrance of the building. The Board of Selectmen has formed an economic development work group to uh, develop an ordinance to create an economic development commission. Just wanted to give an update on the timing of that. Um, the next step will be um, drafting the proposed ordinance with the goal of sharing that with the Board of Selectmen at our July meeting and, um, and then uh, potentially put it to a, a public hearing from there. There is uh, more opportunity this month to enjoy the sculptures, taking up residence in town. Uh, again, tomorrow, June 12th, uh, 5 p.m., there will be a free ice cream social on the grounds of the Simsbury Free Library. While you're there, you can pick up an Art Trail scavenger hunt list. The Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services and State Representative John Hampton are holding a discussion on the issue of depression in senior citizens. That will be taking place Wednesday, June 27th from 1 to 3 p.m. in Program Room 2 at the Simsbury Public Library. And lastly, an, an item that I wanted to update the board on, uh, there is a, um, a public gathering uh, permit proposal uh, that uh, Jerry is working on that would bring a uh, farmer's market to the Terrafield Green, where the gazebo is, um, on uh, Saturday afternoons, I believe, this, this summer. Um, so they're working through some details. We had hoped to get it to tonight's meeting, um, but I'm hopeful that it'll be ready in time for our last meeting of the month. But I wanted to give you an update on that because I may have made a mention of it on SCTV and I wanted to <laughs> make sure you heard it from me rather than, <laughs> rather than on SCTV. Uh, so that's mine. Maria? Thank you. Good evening. So for Board of Selectmen Business, uh, we have included for you the upcoming meeting dates of a number of your work groups and subcommittees. Uh, the work group on the appointment of unaffiliated voters, we have pushed that meeting out to June 18th, so that will be held next week. Um, there is a personal subcommittee meeting scheduled later this month on June 21st. And the Economic Development Work Group was scheduled to meet uh, the Tuesday evening before the 4th of July, but that uh, is a very popular week for vacation, so we have bumped that meeting up to June 25th at 7.30 a.m. 
a quick update on the water shortage ordinance subcommittee. Uh, the committee has continued its review of a proposed draft water shortage ordinance. Um, the draft ordinance is being submitted to the town attorney for review. Uh, the subcommittee, uh, working with staff, did develop a tentative timeline for seeing this through um, to uh, potentially adopting or rejecting the ordinance. So during the course of the summer and early fall, uh, we will bring forward a draft ordinance for the full Board of Selectmen to review. Um, the subcommittee will be recommending that we do a formal referral request to a number uh, of outside agencies as well as some of our internal bodies, uh, including planning, zoning, conservation, the health district, and our Culture, Parks, and Recreation Commission. Uh, we will also be sending uh, correspondence to our community stakeholders um, seeking feedback on the draft ordinance. Uh, we'll be seeking, again, those referrals to come back by essentially end of July. Again, with dates working towards a public hearing uh, to hold on the ordinance with, again, the board um, hoping to either adopt or reject the ordinance uh, by late September. So just wanted to include that timeline and update for you all. Regarding our streetlight policy agenda item, I have distributed uh, a brief memo for you this evening with a recommended motion um, that would accompany this agenda item this evening. Uh, when we do get to that section of the agenda, staff uh, will review that memo with you. Uh, essentially, the purpose of the memo and the motion is to address uh, the receipt of the Eversource rebate monies uh, that were referenced in the cover memo. Um, we did receive those and uh, this motion would allocate or recommend the transfer and allocation of those funds to our existing capital fund for streetlights. So um, again, it's just an additional motion and we'll cover that during uh, that portion of the agenda this evening. For departmental news and notes, I'm happy to report that our library director, Lisa Kareem, has been elected to the position of vice president and president-elect for the Connecticut Library Association. And our library head of adult services, Susan Ray, has been re-elected to the position of Region 2 representative uh, for the Connecticut Library Association. So congratulations to both Lisa and Susan. Yeah, congratulations. For planning and development, two uh, development updates. 690 Hop Meadow Street, which is the um, the mansion right over here on, on the corner, uh, down across from the library. The Zoning Commission did approve the site plan amendment uh, for the conversion of the mansion and annex to a mixed use. Um, the structure will be converted into a first floor space, which will be restaurant space as well as some office space. And the second and third floors of the mansion are going to be converted into seven residential units, a uh, studio, one bedroom, uh, and two bedroom units. Uh, also, uh, 34 Hot Meadow Street, so that's the site of the former CLNP building. Um, the Zoning Commission has received the application for the relocation of Cura Leaf. Uh, they're currently located over on Grismill, and they are uh, hoping to move into that location. And a public hearing has been scheduled on that project for June 18th. June what? 18th. June 18th. And lastly, just a reminder from the town clerk's office that month, uh, the month of June is dog licensing month and dogs are required to be licensed annually. And you can renew your dog licenses by visiting the town clerk's office during normal business hours. And also a reminder to bring proof of rabies vaccination when licensing your dog. And that the town clerk and animal control officer are sponsoring a microchip clinic uh, as well as an opportunity to license your dogs on Saturday, a Saturday. And that is going to be on June 23rd at the Weetog Fire Station. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Moving on now to selectman actions. Item A is tax refund requests. Is there a motion effective June 11th, 2018 to approve the presented tax refunds in the amount of $691.40 and to authorize town manager Maria Capriola to execute the tax refunds? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, item B is the proposed stormwater connection ordinance. So at our May 30th meeting, we had a public hearing on the proposed ordinance. Uh, just to remind folks, the purpose of the ordinance is to prohibit illicit discharge into the sewer system and provide a mechanism for enforcement. During our discussion, a board member proposed a small change to section 10A that describes when the town can enter a property to investigate. Maria, would you mind just describing what the the proposed language is to address that concern? Sure. 
Sure, <laughs> absolutely. So the proposed uh, revision is under Section 10A, Monitoring of Discharges. And the proposed uh, revision reads, upon a finding by an authorized enforcement official that probable cause exists that a violation of this ordinance has occurred, the town shall be permitted to enter and inspect facilities. So um, with the town attorney's assistance, this was language that we developed to address the concern that uh, an authorized enforcement official could only enter premises if, in fact, there was probable cause to do so. Um, so this was the proposed revised language. and. Uh, I had suggested that I didn't feel that this was a substantive change and the town attorney did uh, concur with that. So um, we did not believe that there was a need to schedule a second public hearing. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any questions or any further discussion on the proposed ordinance before we uh, uh, make a motion to adopt it? Um, is there a motion effective June 11th, 2018 to adopt the proposed stormwater connection ordinance as presented, which shall be effective 21 days after publication in a newspaper having circulation within the town of Simsbury, and further move to authorize a summary of the adopted ordinance be published? So moved. Second. Is there any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. And that passes unanimously. Uh, item C is uh, the proposed uh, streetlight policy. Um, so back in uh, November of 2016, the town acquired more than 650 streetlights from Eversource, and those lights have since been converted to LEDs, which have a number of advantages, and um, the town has saved quite a bit of money. Uh, in that process. Um, and the streetlight policy basically outlines the procedures to be used by the Department of Public Works for the operation, maintenance, and replacement of town-owned streetlights. Uh, Tom, any, uh, anything else you I don't know, Eric, you add? really hit all the bases on that. I, I did, <laughs> I did, I took all your... <laughs> no, I, I would just there. say that the, uh, the effort to convert the lights over to LED and to own the lights has worked out very well for us. Um, we've saved a substantial amount of money. Uh, and, and again, I think the big part of this is we're able to provide a little bit closer level of service when our residents call to report a street light um, being out. We now have a vendor that's on call. We deal directly with that vendor. And if for some reason uh, the service isn't done well, we have the ability to correct that directly. So it's worked out very well for us. Uh, any questions for Tom on the proposed policy? I'm not sure it's for Tom, but are you sure we can do this? This isn't a Board of Finance. Uh... <laughs> Sure, so the second motion. Yeah. Sure, sure, so I'd be happy to speak to that piece. So um, we received a little over $72,000 in rebate money from Eversource um, related to the conversion project. And uh, we have, um, with a bit of digging, we have an existing capital fund. It's not a capital account, but an actual capital fund for street lighting. Um, and uh, part of the original proposal uh, back in 2016, um, Tom had done some analysis and had indicated that it would be prudent to to approximately budget about $15,000 per year for uh, future replacement and maintenance costs. So we're not um, faced with a you know, six-figure capital project down the road regarding streetlights as things need to be replaced. And so um, what we are proposing now that we've received the rebate money is that rather than just simply taking that in as a general fund revenue, um, that we would take it in as a general fund revenue and then transfer it to uh, this capital fund for streetlights. Um, so in terms of our process and what we have done here, um, I actually did a bit of a check-in with, uh, with Sean Kimball and he said that um, because it's not necessarily clear in the charter how to handle these sorts of things, but he assured me that the practice has been that he would typically, um, or his predecessors, predecessors would bring this to you all first, and then bring it to the Board of Finance second. Um, so in the proposed motion, we're essentially looking, if, if you support that um, notion of allocating these funds to the capital account for street lighting, um, that we would again transfer that funds, excuse me, transfer those funds recommend appropriation of those funds, but then further move to recommend to the Board of Finance essentially that that same action. Um, that, again, our understanding procedurally is that they've sort of been the last stop along yeah. the process. It's not that I, I, I oppose the, you know, the idea of this, but um, during the budget process over many years we've um, accounted for savings that, you know, we have anticipated savings. So it seems like in the regular general fund budget process, we counted on these rebates coming back at one point. If I could, there's a slight, I just want to make a little clarification there. We had actually, um, within the project budget, 
um, incorrectly assumed that we could apply these um, this grant and this rebate back to the project. There's still um, about $40,000 worth of work that we'd like to do under this um, original project, um, and most of which has to do with rehabilitating the light poles down in Iron Horse Boulevard mm -hmm. within the parking lots down there. The light poles themselves are about 30 years old. Yeah. A number of them are missing. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to use a portion of, of the savings, which we had always planned on accounting for, in order to do that work, and then with the remaining balance to apply that for future maintenance and future replacement. Um, one of the challenges that we have that we didn't have before is we used to pay a very high rate for the electricity for the streetlights, and that included maintenance being done by um, Eversource, and it also included the recapitalization work. Now that we are um, basically managing that ourselves, we have a management responsibility which at this point has a high rate of fluctuation. If one of our light poles comes down because of a strong windstorm, we now are going to bear that cost. And at this point, it's a little, it, you know, peaks and valleys. So if we had an account that was not annualized, such as a capital account, we would be able to better manage that. But you're saying this account already exists. The, the Right. Finance would be extending the capital fund into the future and using that as the basis for this. Sure. We so can do that. So the, the fund exists. This would be <laughs> transferring the revenue into the existing fund. Yeah. I, I guess it's just since it's outside of the normal budget process, it doesn't seem like this is a way we've done this. I don't know. Sure, Maybe I'm just confused, but it's a. Uh, so the um, it just seemed like this should was a, should have been accounted for, and I know we talked about it during your budget presentations about the savings we were going right. to see, right. and we actually reduced some numbers. Right. In, in anticipation of that. Yeah. And, and like I said, mm -hmm. it's, it's been performing very well where um, we're carrying, I think, $25,000 for our streetlight energy and maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can imagine, um, in 2016, we paid $131,000 and change on streetlight. So it's worked out well. Right. This no, is I, just I, a way I of saying, that, happening, you know, instead of in 18 years from now, Mm -hmm. making this just a large capital project again, could we essentially set money aside? Does the, um, it says there are, it's including a current year rebate. So I mean, this isn't just retro for, this is just isn't the bonus and incentive for the conversion that occurred and showing the results of that, that conversion. This is something that could potentially continue to roll forward each year or is this a one-time rebate of this size. The $73,000 is a rebate due to the energy savings from the um, relamping. Okay, so was it just for the, it's just not from the pilot period say, hey, look, you guys, we told you this would happen, you did it, this is the result of it. Mm -hmm. This could continue to, could continue to roll forward? The, the, the funds could roll forward. We are not going to see another um, rebate due to the energy savings. It's a one-time rebate. But it could it could be smart budgeting though to take these savings and save them in this fund so when we get to have to make streetlight repairs we're not stuck with a big bill it, it, exactly right and i think just so it's not confusing um this is actual revenue that we received and ideally um for the current fiscal year budget it would have been budgeted as an anticipated revenue and we would have shown a transfer going to this particular capital fund but that did not happen um, unfortunately so this would sort of be clean up for that essentially again we're taking in this uh, this revenue and then we would be transferring it to the capital fund um, the savings on the expenditure side uh, that was accounted for I believe lat uh, last fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So is that correct, Tom? Yeah, that was accounted for last fiscal year. And, going forward. <laughs> and that would be on the expenditure side. So the savings right. within the operating budget have been accounted for, um, but then the fifteen thousand dollar contribution to the capital account did not get budgeted for. So um, this would help. I think some of those funds would help for those last few years that we didn't fund the capital account. And then moving forward, um, within the context of next year's operating budget, um, Tom and I have flagged that as an item we'll need to you know bring forward as a potential new capital expense moving forward. Yes. Well, now that you explained it that way. I mean, that's illuminated. <laughs> that's um, a... <laughs> so, I mean, I think any, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think anybody would argue that the, the intent of where the money should go and what it should be put for, right? 
we're just stumbling here over process. The process. Is that what we're doing? This is it process. it seems right. like this well, is it, not the usual process. And, and, okay. and I'll be honest, I, I thought when we had put through the original capital project that we would be able to incorporate the rebate money right into the project without having to go through the additional appropriation. But it comes down to the yeah. appropriation sets the upper limit of what you can spend regardless of the income. And that's where my, my engineering ends and finance hat should have went on. And mm -hmm. Now you got somebody to keep you straight. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, and from my perspective, the annual savings that we're seeing now because of the LED lights really is an ongoing yearly cost mm -hmm. that we're not going to see. So th this, I, I understand why we have to do it this way. It's too bad that Eversource isn't able to streamline a little easier, but we still need to do what we need to do. And I think this does give us some <clears throat> potential future cash to do some things with to better prepare for what's going to come down the road. As long as you get the Board of Finance on board, I guess we're okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I think it comes down to them, really. For yeah, we can recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. Not exactly our our lane, but. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> did we, we got to the memo earlier than we than we thought? That's a good discussion. Um, any discussion on the uh, proposed uh, policy itself? No. Okay. Well, like I said, I think it was part of the budgeting process, and we all agreed at the time that this was this was the way to go, and you know we were very supportive of that. It's really just the mechanics here that are I'm questioning. Okay. <laughs> Are you are you comfortable with going forward on a on a vote on this tonight, or are there additional questions you would have? Um, I'm comfortable going forward, but I, I honestly I think it's the board of finances ultimate decision to make. So. Yeah. Ultimately, though, this would be a recommendation to the board right. of finance, right? Okay. Yeah. That's really what we're doing. <laughs> okay. So, All right. Okay. <clears throat> okay. In that okay, case, can I just because the wording isn't to recommend; it is well, to approve. I just want to. Yeah. I just that distinction I just caught. The okay. last. Okay. With the supplemental appropriation. So maybe move effective to recommend approval. We could recommend the transfer. Well, there's. I'm just We're making two motions, right? I think Chris was referring to the motion on the second transfer. one. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're right. The Let's language is fine. Language. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I just. Okay. I was looking at the it's first. It's a little second. confusing. It's fine. Okay. Uh, so let's start with uh, the policy itself. Is there a motion uh, effective June 11th, 2018 to approve the town of Simsbury streetlight policy as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Uh, second, is there a, a motion effective uh, June 11th, 2018 to uh, recommend uh, approval, to recommend the transfer of $72,322 in Ever Eversource rebate funds from the general fund to the existing Streetlight Capital Fund, Fund 527, and appropriation of those funds? Further move to recommend to the Board of Finance approval of this transfer and appropriation. So moved. Second. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. And that passes unanimously. Uh, thank you. So moving on to item D. Is a, I'm just going to stay right here. Stay right there. <laughs> and I won't steal your thunder this time. Why don't you um, set, up, set us up a little bit on background on the uh, proposed fee schedule, uh, both what you're proposing and also the reason uh, why we need to do this? Yeah, well, unfortunately, the reason is... is, is, is you know, world events, and it's relatively sad that it, it comes down here in Simsbury. That for some of our larger events, we now have to be concerned with and worried about the potential for a, a terrorist act. And similar to what we've seen across the world, is there's always the potential for a large vehicle to come into one of our large crowds. Uh, the first time we began discussing this was last year for Simsbury Celebrates, where again, you can we've all been there and you've seen how many people we have um, right in Hot Meadow Street. And working with the police, we identified this as an issue. And so last year, Simsbury Celebrates was the first time that we put our Public Works trucks um, essentially in the roadway to become that immovable object in the event that somebody wishes to do harm to residents of Simsbury. Um, more and more, it looks like we have a number of events where this is going to be necessary. Um, at, to this, at this point, we've done it for Simsbury Celebrates last year. We did it for the Memorial Day Parade this year, and most recently for the Iron Horse um, Marathon and Half Marathon, or Half Marathon and 10K. Um, 
what we would like to propose is that for town events such as the Memorial Day Parade, we do that under our operating budget. Um, for events such as Simsbury Celebrates, the Simsbury Celebrates Committee paid the direct cost. But for events such as the Iron Horse Race Series, for some of the other um, events that we do down on Iron Horse Boulevard and throughout the community, just the same way that um, the organizers pay for extra duty officers, they would be paying for um, the use of our large trucks. Um, our trucks are only as recommended by the police department. We are not the ones making the decision of where and how they're gonna be situated. The only thing we have done on our staff um, is we've made sure that they're actually filled with sand as ballast and we also attach the plows to them. Which uh, fortunately at this point you all know why the plows are on in May and June. Mm -hmm. um, but that's part of the package. We wanna make those vehicles as large and yeah. heavy as they can be. So Tom, is this gonna be a requirement? This is going to be a requirement as, as, as set for okay. um, as set by the police department. Okay. Okay. And it works out well because um, our staff and the police department work closely together um, all the time. And during an event such as this, um, they have the radio so they can communicate. And especially for something like um, something very celebrates where you have that shift. Right. It, it does come in handy to be able to communicate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you folks, I mean, we, we mentioned it last meeting, but you folks were clearly present at the Memorial Day Parade, and I think added to the the parade too for for a lot of people. Aside, so how many how many trucks were there again? And I believe there person? was uh, four at that event. Oh, there was mm -hmm. four, and that and then each of those had one staff member. One staff member. Staff member. Okay, and, and that and we 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 did a um, bear a cost for that. That event that wasn't done out of the goodwill. No. So, what is the um, so what is the average? So that event was probably shorter than Simsbury celebrates. I think. What's the average cost you think is coming out to? So um, I think it's in the it wasn't in the proposal. So yeah, based upon the ones that you think are going to be the events that you think are going to be the ones that would be adopted for this type of application of these trucks, what do you think the cost is? And what we're looking at is just the, 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 the cost for the staff. The trucks, we own the trucks, the amount of fuel they use is yeah. de minimis. Um, we do have a four hour minimum for any um, weekend work when we call them in. Yep. Um, First four hours, okay. So and, and then we do have a difference between um, Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. Sundays and holidays are at double time. Um, Double time, the rate for our employees is in the range of 60 to $72 an hour, depending upon which staff member um, is out there. 72 would be the extreme. It would be for one of our crew leaders. Usually they're not the ones who are gonna be taking that overtime. Um, on Saturdays, it's 45 to $54 an hour. And the way this is set up, there, that first four hours does have a little bit of um, extra in it, and it's so that we don't have to nickel and dime and worry about which staff members are there. Um, and we are hoping if that does um, evolve into having a fund, that will then offset some of the other costs for such as the Memorial Day Parade or other situations where we may be called in. And again, I would just reiterate, our, uh, it's sad that we have to be talking about doing this. I understand. But I can tell you that our guys have really taken it um, to heart and, and want to be part of uh, making well, it Well, I safer. appreciate the policy wording as well in there clearly outlining your, your expectations of the team and stuff, so. Okay, any other questions or discussion on this item? My, my only comment would be, uh, I, I agree with Tom, it's, it's very sad that we have to do this. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's good that we can do it, and uh, I know uh, I noticed on Memorial Day that it was a good thing. It was nice to see them as part of the community, and uh, it was nice, so thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there uh, so? Actually, before I get to the motion, I want to clarify why we're doing this. Um, so we're making the motion retroactive to June third, which encompasses the Iron Horse Half Marathon. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that they they were aware that they were going to likely be having this this. Fee. Yes. Yes, they were aware. Okay, <laughs> I assume so. <laughs> just wanted. I wanted also make sure that was. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because okay. um, Public Works is involved in something like the marathon for years in bringing out barricades and things like that, and, and we've never charged for that, and this is the first thing that we've had to charge okay. for. But but as you said, Mike, it, it's it's part of what the guys need to do in terms of public safety. So. Okay. Is there a motion uh, retroactive to June 3rd, 2018, to approve the proposed fee schedule for the use of Public Works staff and trucks at community events? So moved. Second. 
Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and that passes. Uh, item uh, E and F are both uh, items stemming from uh, the personnel subcommittee. So I asked uh, Chris to lead the discussion on both of these. Yeah, so the first uh, deals with recommendations as to acting town manager coverage when our town manager um, per, you'll see in the charter, um, is not available in, for short um, periods of time and needs to identify someone. Specifically what Maria saw was Chapter 5, Section 503C of the Charter, which provides for the town manager to appoint an acting town manager for periods of temporary absence of 15 or fewer days consistent with policies established by the Board of Selectmen. The specific charter language is in case of disability or temporary absences of the town manager, or in vacancy in the office of the town manager, the Board of Selectmen may designate an acting town manager, except the town manager may designate an acting town manager for temporary absences not to exceed 15 days, consistent with policies established by the Board of Selectmen. So in essence, the town manager for temporary absences identifies a temporary uh, acting town manager. So what Maria wanted to do was bring her recommendation as to what the sequence of that backup would be. And she just had a brief conversation with the um, personnel subcommittee as a prelude to this. This is not something that we have to take action on. And specifically what she's recommending is the first person that she would designate would be the deputy um, town manager, which would be Melissa Appleby. And the second individual would be the director of public works, which would be Tom Roy. Um, both individuals whose scope of work are broad enough uh, to justify this as well as two individuals that are interacting uh, consistently with Maria. Um, so she wanted to just run that recommendation by this group to see if there were you know, any reactions or basically to get an endorsement of that. And as you can see in her packet, she has uh, her, a sample of what her communication would be um, when she's in a position to make that designation. So with that as a uh, opening, I, I would open up any mm -hmm. questions or comments. I think it's good management. Mm -hmm. Puts it right out there so everybody knows what's going on, what the process will be. Um, yeah. I think it's a good thing. Why, why wouldn't we just move forward with this? I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't want to delay. Yeah. This, this, is, this, is how, this, this has like almost zero applicability. I mean, relative to the instances that it will occur, it's incredibly logical. It provides mm -hmm structure and format right you guys look through it so what what would we debate even more we now? don't need to debate yeah. it's, it's yeah. per the charter it's actually the town manager's decision so, so she's mm -hmm. really just reviewing what her decision would be just to get our feedback and input so right. and for those absences greater than 15 days um it would, it would be the same order correct okay. but it would need to come to the board of selectmen Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. And, um, so it's just a procedural. It's right. just procedural. Yeah. The, the yeah. charter did have language um, around the manager designating acting town manager, but there were a few words that said as I uh, excuse me, uh, as consistent with the policies established by the board of selectmen. So I just before mm -hmm. I came onto a situation needing to designate sure. someone, I just wanted to make sure that you were comfortable with that approach. Yeah. Um, particularly, I was just thinking um, this fall, um, the International City Managers Association, which is a professional association that Melissa and I belong to, um, has our annual professional development conference and so um, again just sort of thinking ahead that's a good for example of a time um, where uh, either myself or, or both of us may you know temporarily be absent and out of state um, or with the summer season approaching if I happen to maybe go away for a few days and I'm going to be of considerable distance um, again where it makes sense to have somebody on site who could be available in the event of an emergency or um, again if we need a uh, signature on something, again, if I'm going to be far away, I just want to make sure that there's somebody here um, who's capable, such as Melissa or Tom, who can sort of step in and just take care of those those things and make sure that the ship continues to, to move ahead, even if I'm not here. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, thank okay. you. Thank you. So we're good. Well, we, mm -hmm. we are good. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. The first item. Yeah. Right. So, um, as you know, we have uh, um, a requirement when uh, there's turnovers in positions to review the job description. Uh, we have an individual that was uh, in the position of land use and building clerk part-time who has uh, accepted uh, another position within the organization. 
And so what you have before you is a job description which has been reviews, reviewed with uh, very mild, um, mild, minor changes. Um, most of those changes are specific to language that that role supports you know, all of the land use staff uh, as opposed to uh, the building um, officials specifically. Uh, so with that as a background, you know, I'll make a motion uh, effective June 11th, 2018 to approve the proposed modifications to the job description for the part-time clerical position in the Planning and Community Development Department as presented and for the job title for the position to be changed to Land Use and Building Clerk. Second that. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, that was good. Uh, moving on to uh, item uh, G and H, uh, both relate to the Simsbury Performing Arts Center. Uh, the first is uh, is uh, looking at their uh, 2017 and 2016 audit. Um, so 16, section 16 of the facility operations agreement between the town and the Simsbury Performing Arts Center requires uh, the Performing Arts Center to perform an annual audit and then to submit that audit uh, to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, so with that, I wanted to see if any uh, board members had any uh, questions for Dave that he can answer. Okay. Hearing none, uh, is there a motion effective June 11th, 2018 to accept the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center uh, December 31st, 2017, and 2016 audit as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and that passes unanimously. Uh, item H is a uh, proposed revision to their mission statement. So the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and the Greater Hartford Arts Council have given grants to SPAC for uh, board assessment and strategic planning purposes. And one of the recommendations uh, was that the mission statement be revised to be more concise. Uh, so any, uh, anything else you would want to add to that? No, we, um, two years ago, we uh, started talking about what should we be doing in developing ourselves as a port? And the Hartford Foundation funded an assessment done by a consultant. And then he recommended that we do a, a strategic plan and that we um, get a grant to do that, which we did. And the Hartford Foundation funded that. And we brought in Webb Associates, who had done the um, consulting job for the town in 2000. 12, I think it was 13, and we worked with them and one of the recommendations was to focus our um, mission statement more precisely and along with our strategic plan which was to focus on community events and to move on and hire an executive director. So that's the actions we're taking and, and according to, accordance with our uh, contract, uh, we're asking for your approval of, of that change. Any questions for, for Dave or, or comments on the yeah, mission I statement? Yeah, I just had a question. I'm, yeah. I'm fine with it. Um, I just noticed that the uh, the previous mission statement had a little bit more language about events and entertainment and culture, and this one is more broad. I just was interested, Dave, besides shortening it, the kind of the, the area of focus, you know, what was the thinking around that? Well, I think... Um, the, the recommendation of the consultant was that we as a board should focus more on fundraising and less on operation and that we should hire an executive director and we should focus on bringing funds in to support that activity and that we should narrow or focus on uh, not be so broad in our uh, in our mission statement uh, I don't think there's a great philosophical difference. It's really uh, a semantic thing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. that was recommended. And the board accepted it and said, okay, uh, let's do that. And so we voted to do it. And it says right in the, in the packet, no change in mission is, applied, is implied right. by that. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Okay. 
Is there a motion effective June 11th, 2018 to approve the revised mission statement of Simsbury Performing Arts Center, Inc., as presented? So moved. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, and uh, we're going to actually stick with um, Simsbury Performing Arts Center business as we move to appointments and resignations. Uh, item A is uh, uh, the uh, request to approve uh, the following uh, board members. Um, so is there a motion effective June 11th, 2018 to appoint 10 members to the Simsbury Meadows Performing Arts Center Board of Directors as presented? Uh, Catherine Barnard with a term expiring April 30th, 2021. Do I have to read these or can we just say as presented? Um, I think you'd probably say as presented and then just the motion in the minutes would reflect the yes. Okay. I say yes, you can All do right. that. All right. <laughs> That'll save us a little bit of time. Um, is, there a, is there a motion to approve as I'm presented? I'm just going to know who they are. So they're, they're in the packet, they're and this was public the, information. Uh, we're not, we're, uh, pardon, to, this we're was, not privy to that. This was posted on our town website, right. so no, this was made public. It was public. posted prior to the meeting. Is there a motion? I'm, I'm uh, so moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, got to do some advertising. <laughs> we have an event on the 23rd, which is Simsbury Solstice, and there are four bands. It's going to go from like 3 o'clock to, um, I think, 9 on Saturday. These are quite accomplished guys, and uh, there's four different bands that are going to do Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, Tribute to Santana, and the Tribute to Fish. Everybody knows them except me. <laughs> 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 You're selling yourself short. <laughs> and this is the, I'm sure you've seen this, everybody's on the mailing list for oh, yeah. talking about a music festival. But on the 29th is the Celebrate America concert. And uh, Thank we'll, you. of course, with good weather, we'll have thousands and thousands of people there. And it will end, of course, with fireworks. So we'll make sure everybody in the audience and everybody here comes and enjoys the, the great event. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fingers crossed for excellent weather on Friday yes. this summer. Dave, quick, quick question. The ticket booth, is everything else squared away there? The ticket booth is in operation. The symphony is moving in at uh, the end of this week, I think. And we'll set up their ticketing machines. And I don't know what their ticket, their, their booth schedule will be, but they'll be selling tickets from that, uh, from that location. I just I have one other. I mean, I, is there? It, it seems like the the fencing that exists currently from if you take the stage and you follow the the path around the road exiting onto Iron Horse. That yes, the fencing there is looks a little. We're going temporarily to, suspect. I don't we're know. We're going to revisit the, the uh, <laughs> layout of that. Um, the objective was to try to move unticketed personnel out of the adjacent area to the stage and we're going to put up a sign that says when you come in from the street um, you can't go past the sign that says unticketed will say unticketed personnel are not permitted beyond this point and the actual ticket gate will be further in but we're trying to prevent uh, people from sitting out and not paying which the promoters are very much uh, in favor of. In favor of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm sure it, it's all baby steps. We can only get to so many projects one at a time, but I know that's not your the permanent look, uh, a solution that you have for that. No, that mm -hmm. people comment it, comment on it quite often, you know, who are down there for other events outside of the, the wonderful events you guys sponsor down there. Okay, well, we'll put that on our list of things to raise money for. <laughs> We, we had anticipated uh, putting some higher fencing up with graphics on it, and uh, we haven't found a way to raise the money for that yet. And then we have to go to everybody and design review and oh, yeah. so forth. Yeah. We love process. It's a process, but uh, hey, that's what we're here for. 
So the Simsbury Performing Arts Center does have a, a full-time executive director, but we got to remember that none of this really wouldn't happen without the engine of your board. So thank you yes. for you and, and your thank board's you, hard work. Thank you, yeah. Appreciate your support. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, with appointments and resignations, item B, uh, is there a motion to uh, accept the resignation of Dante Valentino with our thanks as a member of the Juvenile Review Board? So move with, with our thanks. He was a big uh, contributor. Interesting perspective. Second. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, item C is the proposed appointment of uh, Andrea Erickson as a member of the Juvenile Review Board. And my understanding is that she has the same skill set uh, that, yes. we're, that we're losing. Um, so is there a motion to um, approve that appointment? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? OK. D is the proposed appointment. Can I just add one? Thing? Yeah. So just um, also wanted to highlight for you Kristen and I took an opportunity to go back and try and uh, find the original policy or purpose for the Juvenile Review Board, um, particularly uh, with an interest in learning about the membership composition. And what we discovered is that the policy um, for the Juvenile Review Board actually dates back to 1982, uh, which we did include in the packet for you. It is quite dated. Uh, and we have uh, made that a priority this summer to really, uh, we've obtained samples and we're working on an update to that policy, um, including membership comp composition. And so we will do our best to bring that to you later this summer well, I, will, I will share um, as uh, the liaison to that group it's an interesting group of people we all kind of bring a different perspective um, and it's I think at least for my seat been successful with interacting with the uh, uh, young men and women that come before us so I think it's good okay. Uh, item D, is there a motion uh, to appoint uh, Grant uh, Gritzmacher as an alternate member of the Conservation Commission slash Inland Wetlands Agency? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, and item E is the uh, resignation of uh, Woodrow Woody Eddins as a regular member of the Housing Authority and Community for Care. <laughs> well, um, it just makes me sad. It's, 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 it's a heartbreaker for you. It is a heartbreaker for me. <laughs> um, well, I, I will make the motion to accept his resignation very reluctantly. Um, Pastor Woody Eddins has, um, he's been on the housing board as, as long as I've been there, and uh, which was before I was on this board. And his, his compassion and his willingness to step in wherever he is needed has always Im impressed me. And, and he is an inspiration to all of us volunteers um, because he never, you know, he never stops to say, you know, should I do this or not? He's, he's always stepping up to help. And he doesn't matter which you know, he doesn't care which party you're in or, or what you look like or anything else. Um, he's going to try to help you and treat you with respect and dignity, no matter who you are. And particularly for those residents of, you know, Owen Murphy Apartments and Virginia Connolly, um, you know, a lot of people don't even know we have a housing authority, <laughs> much less who lives there. And he has dedicated his time and talents to improving their situation. And I for one, greatly appreciate it. And as for the Community for Care, um, he was my co-chair um, for a couple of years, and um, I will certainly miss, again, his compassion and his wise counsel as to um, how we present our information. And I'm sure Chris would you might want to say something about Woody's participation. Oh, absolutely. He's just uh, <laughs> a very caring and a very wise person. So. Uh, yeah. You will definitely be missed in the be community missed. overall. So, yes. And he's retiring after about 40 years in the ministry, and wish him the we do. a lot of happiness in retirement. Here. Um, so Cheryl, uh, put the motion on the table. Would any, <laughs> anyone want to? Chris, I'll second. Second it. All in favor? With our thanks. With our thanks. Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. okay. Thank I you. Take it back. <laughs> 
And uh, next is the review of uh, meeting minutes. Any uh, proposed changes to the minutes from our regular meeting on May 30th? I didn't see anything. Okay, then they'll stand as presented. Uh, does anyone have any uh, liaison or subcommittee reports that they wanted to share? Mm -hmm. Not I. Yeah. Okay, and I think I, sh I shared uh, mine, which is the um, uh, Economic Development Commission ordinance. We hope to get to you in July for feedback. Okay, uh, on communications. Um, there was um, one item that I wanted to make sure that the board was updated on, and so you you all sort of knew uh, the thinking in the process, and I'm, I'm glad Kristen is here. Um, so, where was, there we go. Um, so, the, the memo from um, a director of community and social services, Kristen Formanak, on the um, age-friendly community designation. So that was um, something that the Aging and Disability Commission brought to the Board of Selectmen. And Kristen looked into it to try to understand how much staff time would this require. And in looking into it, um, you're basically proposing that there's another designation, which would be a senior center uh, designation, which could potentially carry, you know, more weight, you wrote, and take a lot less time to obtain. Um, so I'm interested in hearing a little your, your thoughts on that, um, but I think the next step, since this originally came from Aging and Disability, would be to share that with them and, and get their thoughts on that, which I believe is going to happen tomorrow night. Yes, I was, I was just going to mention that, but I didn't want to say that if that wasn't the case. Yeah. yeah. So that would be good, in case any members of the public want to attend Aging and Disability tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at Eno. Sure. Um, I can lead off and yeah. would sure. welcome Kristen to, to jump in. So. Um, Correct. So Kristen and I will be meeting with the Aging and Disability Commission tomorrow evening, um, providing uh, an update on a number of the special projects and initiatives that we do have underway at the moment. Um, something that uh, I felt that was important for her and I to share is that um, while both the ARP designation as well as um, senior center accreditation I think would be worthy initiatives for us to undertake. Um, we do have a bit of a staffing capacity issue at the moment with current projects and initiatives underway for social services for the summer and fall. We do have um, a considerable number of time sensitive projects that we're working on. Um, and we also have the very positive and wonderful addition of the new staff member um, so that uh, we are working on that initiative in terms of preparing job descriptions, uh, doing salary compensation um, analysis. Uh, so we will be bringing all of that to personal subcommittee. Um, within that context, there will obviously be some reorganization of duties for staff and onboarding that person. Um, we are working also in the packet tonight under communications. Um, we have two wonderful trustees um, who have been helping with all of our social services trusts for over 35 years and they have decided to retire. Um, so we need to, the summer to find new trustees, help onboard them, help train them. Um, we're working on the juvenile review board process. So again, we just, we have a number of uh, initiatives underway that would make taking on either of these very significant initiatives at this time um, a bit difficult. And so again, we do plan just to give an update on all the good work that Kristen and her staff are doing outside of the normal day to day. Um, and then also wanted to talk a little bit about why we were interested in the senior center, potentially um, accreditation. Uh, in part, um, you know, our understanding, and we're both new to the community, but our understanding, you know, has been that either building a new senior center or renovating the existing um, space at Eno has been an important priority for the community. And two advantages to the senior center accreditation that, that we've talked about is per one is uh, the program assessment component. So uh, we could really learn what we're doing well and what we're not doing so well. Again, hopefully positioning us well for that future project. Um, but also what we've learned from other communities who do have the designation is it does improve our ability to um, to raise funds outside of town general fund dollars for capital projects for senior centers. So again, that potential for um, positioning ourselves well to apply for small cities funding through DECD, to apply f uh, for private grants and other grant funding opportunities is that if we were able to obtain that designation, it does substantially uh, improve our chances of being able to obtain grant funding for that project. So those were some of the thoughts we had discussed. I don't know, Kristen, if you wanted to, to add any. No, I think that that's a really good summary. Um, one of the things that Maria mentioned is looking at the large initiatives that we're undertaking right now in social services. Um, and there are a lot of really good, wonderful programs and projects that we're working on, and that's taking up the majority of our time, as you said, for summer and fall. Um, and 
when I was asked to take a look at this, I looked at what would be the best next step for the social services in the senior center right now. Um, and I think that one of the things that we can also consider is that if we have the senior center um, accreditation, that we can then use that as a building block towards the age-friendly community designation, uh, which takes a, a lengthier time process than the accreditation. <coughs> accreditation can be done in about a year. Um, and the age-friendly community is about a five-year project. Um, so, you know, if we take one at a time, it might be a good next step for us. So, do you have any questions for me after this memorandum that you've digested? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a couple. So, um, um, so one thought is to, to work on the, the uh, senior center designation as a step towards the age-friendly designation. I mean, how seriously is that a, a consideration? Um, well, I think that, you know, that's something to be answered by yourself as the board as what steps you want us to take as, as well as what steps the commission wants to continue to follow. Um, working on the senior center accreditation is something that's largely done by staff. Um, it's mostly a self-assessment tool that's given to you through um, the NCOA and you look at all of your policies and procedures and programs and how they line up with other senior centers that are accredited. Um, so after you've done that self-assessment tool you have an outside representative that comes in and, and decides whether or not you've passed that um, accreditation and as Maria said that helps you to um, get grant funding and to have a more solid standing in the state um, I think that there's a lot of value in the AARP age-friendly um, designation as a livable community that's something that's coming up in a lot of, of communities is how livable is your community as our population ages um, and you want to be able to attract and retain your seniors in your community um, so I don't think that it's necessarily uh, I think that it is a good thing for us to look into but since it's a longer term project and as Maria said we don't have the staff time to designate to forming it right now um, and it is a much larger project. It's something where you're going to involve many stakeholders within the community um, and you're really going to be looking to improve the eight areas of livability upon which you are scored. Um, so the other factor that I tried to consider was not only the time but the financial impact to the town um, because to achieve that higher livable score you're going to have to take on more projects that involve more than just my department for example looking at walkability so how many streets have sidewalks and um, uh, traffic lights and things of that nature crosswalks and what needs to be improved so you might also be looking at talking about increasing Tom's budget um, to achieve that status just um, um, I, I had read the memo to be more that the senior center designation was more value added than the um, age friendly community um, but what you're presenting if you are I mean because what came out is potentially one is a stepping stone to the other and I, I think we should be pretty clear in the conversation with aging and disability which it is mm -hmm. um, and 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 I know we're not we wouldn't necessarily be making a decision right now, but I just think those are two very different recommendations is yeah. I'm pointing out. And I think a little bit of clarity, you know, tomorrow with aging and disability would be worthwhile. Um, the other thing is I see both as being worthwhile. I mean, we're working on a, on a senior center, so clearly getting some tangible results with that makes total sense. At the same time, we have this vision of, you know, making Simsbury the greatest you know, community in the world for seniors to live in, and I can see the AARP one contributing to that. Um, I do think that resources are an issue. I just wouldn't overstate, I, I'd like the initial discussion to be more ground and intellectually, which is the, the best one for Simsbury right now, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, this one requires more resources as opposed to you know, the senior center, and so that's, I, I just would hesitate to use that as a reason right now and I am sensitive that so much of where we succeed in Simsbury is capturing the energy of people and groups that want to do things mm -hmm. and I just want I just want to be sensitive to where the energy is and where the intellectual thinking on this is from the aging and disability um, 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 committee in particular if they were willing to step up and commit and put a lot of time and resources into it so yeah those are just some thoughts mm -hmm. you know, along the way sure I think you're gonna have um, I don't want to say 
bruised feelings, but you know, the senior center discussion has gone on and on and on for the last 25 years and culminating over the last few years with numerous studies, program analysis, space analysis. I mean, all those things that you just mentioned were all done for, you know, when we were going to make a new senior center. Um, and I'm concerned that that argument is going to fall flat for the people who put so much time and effort, um, all of those stakeholders um, who worked on the senior center for the last decade or so and, and ended up not and getting anything, you know, that they wanted. So I would be sensitive to that, mm -hmm. you know, when you are saying what, you know, the priorities are. Um, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time and energy and volunteer work, you know, trying to get the Senior Center going, and I think we should be sensitive to that effort. <laughs> and not knowing those efforts and the history being new, um, it sounds like some of that work that's already been done might tie nicely into both of these projects, but especially with the Senior Center accreditation, mm -hmm. which is, like I said, it's largely a self-assessment tool. So if that work has already been done, then maybe this will be something that's a little bit, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to say easier for us to accomplish, but will help us to accomplish that Well, that's that what goal. I mean. I, th I think you should, you know, look to what we already have mm -hmm. um, because we, we put a lot of, of effort into that. So... It would be good if we could put that to a good use and uh, <laughs> agreed and not to reinvent the wheel yes sure. exactly right. yep. well and, and, and it shows respect for the people who did all that work you mm -hmm. know because a lot of seniors participated in that process as stakeholders and many of them will give you their opinions quite forthrightly <laughs> on their own. <laughs> so. And that, that's great because this shouldn't be done in a vacuum, right? Yeah. I, I think to, to both uh, Chris's and Cheryl's uh, points, I think a lot of this has been done. I would encourage you not to just focus on the perception of the amount of effort because uh, the, the good news is when, when you go to the meeting tomorrow night, if it's the two of you, you're both the new kid on the block. Right. <laughs> that's good news and bad news. <laughs> um, but I think. A number of things have been done, and um, you will definitely hear from people about what they want. And uh, you know, I don't think there's anybody sitting here who does not would not prefer to have built a senior center. It was really mm -hmm. how to fund it, how to pay for it, and and uh, but uh, I think what should be our next step is is what I heard Chris say not looking at the, the amount of work or the dollars it's what should be the next step to to move us closer to that and uh, that's what i would encourage you to do mm -hmm. okay. thank you chris you're welcome yeah um and the next item i don't know if you want me to stay up oh or, or we, um so. would you like us to speak at all to the trusts or sure okay. sure oh sure um so the we have um several trust funds that are monitored by the probate court and they are combined under the um, Belden Trust and we have had two trustees that have been with us as Maria said for over 30 years and we met with them just a few weeks ago and they did convey to us that they felt that it was time for them to step down um, respectfully so and we were notified last week that they intend to um, tender their resignation at the close of actually this fiscal year, so at the end of June. So we did a little work, a little research with the probate court into the process to replace those two members, um, and we feel comfortable in our understanding of that. And we are going to work on looking to members of the community that are um, considered to be held in the highest regard to fill those positions. And we'll move forward with making a recommendation to you and then to the probate court to fill those positions. Um, we report to the court of probate uh, typically in November so hopefully we'll have enough time to find two new trustees and have them spend some time with the outgoing trustees so that they understand the process um, so I'm hoping oh. that it's going to be as straightforward as that <laughs> how, how um, the so clearly you, how, how often I haven't been around long enough I'm 
not to say that you've been robbed terribly long, Chris. <laughs> I hate to say that. Uh, no. How often does that position, um, those positions, turn over? Those trustee positions. Turn over? Um, well, the trustee What's positions. Years, those two trustees have been in place. Well, I heard that thirty-five. Yeah. But I mean, if we had. I, 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 mean, I hope we've had a little bit of turnover for thirty-five years. Other than that, no, 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 no actually, no. no. Oh and, um, really so <laughs> then, I mean, do is it so you have to go through a new uh, appointment process? I mean, as far as what is the specs for the trustee of the of today and the future and such, and the expectations of that person, and then clearly. Uh, I mean, for lack of a better term, marketing this, because I don't even, speaking to Cheryl's point earlier mm -hmm. about the housing in town, I would say that how many people in this town even know that that trust exists, the function of it, mm -hmm. those the good work being done behind it, the intentions of it, and, uh, you know, we could have an opportunity here to bring in people that uh, who have no idea that it exists, the opportunity exists, who are incredibly well qualified for that. So I don't know how you get the word out, how you market it, but that seems like a wonderful opportunity for further community engagement by some extremely qualified and passionate people. Sure, sure. So um, what's really interesting is the our, 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 excuse me, our understanding of the history of the appointments um, through the current uh, trustees is that it typically had been uh, the Board of Finance chair at the time, if they were serving as the Board of Finance and a vacancy happened, that that individual was approached. Um, and if they were unable or unwilling to serve, that a person um, with a financial background and that the second position had traditionally been held by a local attorney. Um, it's not saying that we have to do that, but that was just sort of the history or, or the tradition. Um, and one of the uh, one of the wills, uh, yes, thank you, the Southwell will, um, specifically designates that one of the trust has to be a man. Um, that, the, that the will documents actually say that in perpetuity. So at least one of the trust um, trustees does need to be a, a man. So it's, it's an odd sort of requirement, but I think that one dates back to the early 1900s. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and new it's, every day. It's one yes. of the largest. Okay. Correct. Okay. Amen. Chris, I didn't mean Step to say up. you've been around for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, they wanted to have two males, and I stood up at that board meeting oh, I know. in 1900 and said, no, we need to be more open-minded than that. That's it. Chris, you just lost your one vote to try to get on. <laughs> Women can't vote, so you that's can't right. be a trustee. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully that's an open, I mean, as, as open a process as it can be, obviously, it's delineated by those, those requirements. Yeah. But I mean, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to draw from, I imagine, that some amazing talents that are, some oh. gems that are out there in our community right. to support that Too going forward. forward with people right. stepping yeah. down. Absolutely. And we'll plan to keep you all updated. Um, one of the things that we learned about the process from probate is that there is um, a board that's designated by probate, um, and it's the board that would technically recommend the appointments. Um, and we did list that in the correspondence, um, but that currently consists of Kristen, uh, Tom Roy, our town attorney, our deputy town manager, um, Eric uh, is actually on that. And I feel like, oh, the Bank of America person that was, again, appointed by the court. So um, technically it would be that group would make recommendations to the probate court. Um, and I'm sure that they'll, they'll do a good job to, to find some suitable folks for us. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other items under communications that anyone wanted to bring up? Okay. Um, one item I just wanted to give uh, folks a heads up about. Um, I am interested in getting on uh, the agenda in two weeks from now a conversation about uh, arranging a goal setting session for this board because I know that there was a lot of interest in that. Um, but that could take a whole number of different forms. So I just wanted to plant the seed now um, that that'll be a discussion item so you can give some thought uh, to, to what that would look like. Um, I know I have, I have some ideas and I've talked to a few members, but I'm interested in getting some feedback and then um, setting that up uh, at some point this summer um, so we could really talk about what the next like year and a half of this term would look like and then other things that we, you know, other seeds we might want to plant that would bear fruit after, you know, the two years are up. So uh, the last item is, uh, is there a motion to adjourn to executive session? Uh, with uh, Maria Capriola, Melissa Appleby, Jamie Rabbit, Bob DiCrescenzo, and Jesse Langer to discuss the Deepwater Wind Appeal, and also uh, with Attorney Jonathan Zellner to discuss uh, T. Martin versus the town of Simsbury. So moved. Second. So, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay.
Thank you, everybody, so for coming. I'm reading through the people that are going to decide who these two people will be. <laughs> Three more women. What do you do? Well, clockwork. Every 35 years. I think there's only 28 before.